This is the second part of a double podcast episode on the life and activism of Ben Fletcher. If you haven't listened to part one yet, I'd go back and listen to that first. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. Solidarity forever. For the union makes us strong. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no greater power anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one? But the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever, for the union makes... Where we left off last time, local eight of the industrial workers of the World Union had successfully organised workers at the Port of Philadelphia with the leadership of black dock worker and organiser Ben Fletcher. Soon after their first successful strike... Across the Atlantic and Europe, major upheaval was about to begin. World War I, of course, began in Europe in 1914, even though the United States didn't declare war until April of 1917. But the IWW, as were many other left organizations in the United States and other countries, critical of the war from the outset. That proved important because the federal government later made use of the IWW's pre-war criticisms of the U.S. in its wartime trial. However, during the war, U.S. shipping actually will benefit um, because American uh, ships are being, sending off uh, food, military supplies, and other things to Britain and France, even though technically America is neutral. During the war also, the United States uh, ports on the Atlantic coast are booming. Yeah, And so Fletcher will be dispatched more than once to different ports, before the war began, most of the European left and workers' movement opposed the impending war, declaring that it would be a fight between rival imperialisms, with working class people sent to fight and kill one another for the benefit of a wealthy elite. However, when the war actually broke out, most left parties and unions in Europe quickly abandoned their principles and lined up behind their local ruling class. But the fighting hadn't yet directly involved the United States. This changed in April 1917, when the US officially declared war on Germany. The government then passed the Espionage Act, which essentially criminalised people for even verbally criticising the war. While the IWW in some countries like Australia, like we discussed in our episode 19, was heavily involved in organising against World War I, in the US after the war began, the Union didn't say much about it. The federal government's fear was that the IWW was trying to organize and was planning to pull off a mass strike during the war, which would undermine the war effort. There is no evidence that that was the case, and the federal government actually didn't present any evidence of that. They just presented evidence that the IWW was anti-war, rhetorically speaking. But it is true that, one, the Wobblies had actually organized in a number of industries important for this war effort, shipping, agriculture, mining, timber, those are all really pivotal industries for a country, including a country at war. It's also true that Wobblies didn't really care about the war. And so there were strikes that the Wobblies were pulling during the war, including out west, that by implication did impact the war effort. But there's never been any evidence, and I seriously doubt that there was any plan to sort of conduct some mass strike to undermine the U.S. during the war, even though most Wobblies were not very sympathetic to the war. Um, although there were divisions within the IWW, um, the IWW never took an official stand against the war, even though the Socialist Party was more openly principled against the war. Most Wobblies probably personally were against the war. Uh, most famously, the Wobbly leader Frank Little was lynched in Montana for being probably the most outspoken anti-war activist in the IWW as well as organizing copper miners in Butte, which was the center of the nation's copper industry and was very much a sort of a, a site of organizing on the part of radical miners. As for Ben Fletcher, well, we don't really know if he was pro or anti-war per se. We do know that he and other wobbly leaders in Philadelphia 
did hold a meeting where they encouraged members of Local 8 early in the war to um, not resist and to register for the draft, which was legal, or, or I should say was required, and other things. And so actually, I explore this issue much more in my book, Wobblies on the Waterfront. Some people considered Local 8's stance to be not very principled anti-war. And it's true, right? Like, I mean, Local 8 didn't take a stand against the war. And many of the ships that they loaded probably in 1917 and 18 did have cargo that might have helped the United States Armed Forces in France. Were they just trying to keep their heads down and therefore not bring attention to themselves and maybe survive wartime persecution? Well, if that was their hope, that didn't happen. They still were persecuted, even though they hadn't actively undermined the war effort. This lack of actual anti-war agitation didn't prevent the IWW being targeted by law enforcement. The Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, began heavy surveillance of IWW members and activists, including Fletcher. For example, this was a report by an agent, Henry Bowen, about a visit to Fletcher's apartment in Boston on the 3rd of July 1917. Pursuant to instructions of Special Agent Keller to further pursue the investigation of Ben Fletcher, organizer of the IWW, who it was alleged by Patrolman Allen of Police Station 5 had been passing out IWW literature. And when Patrolman Allen searched the room of Fletcher, he stated he saw some IWW literature in a suitcase. Agent Today made a second visit to the room of Ben Fletcher and his white wife and white daughter, about 10 years of age, and plainly stated the allegations to Fletcher, and asked him if he was willing to show me the contents of his suitcase, etc. He willingly submitted to a search of all his effects on the premises. Upon leading Fletcher into conversation, he stated he had been organizer of IWW Longshoremen, but has discovered the folly of this, as he has been unable to secure or keep any kind of job since his connection as organizer of the IWW. He is now employed in a soap factory in Cambridge, working nights. Fletcher did admit that he formerly kept some IWW literature at his home, but when he moved recently from 542 Shawmut Avenue to 5 Medford Court, he threw out all of the literature he then had. Fletcher is the real type of Southern N-word agitator, with no education, poor grammar. He is about 5 foot 9 inches in height, weighs 185 pounds, and is reputed by the police as a bad man or gunfighter. He did not display any of that to agent. In reference to other matters about articles purported to be written by a colored citizen in which the draft act is criticized, does not think Fletcher capable of expressing himself in the same manner as these matters have been expressed. Agent feels that Fletcher is not very harmful to the United States government. Of course, the actual report includes the full racial slur. And the racism in the rest of the report is pretty obvious as well, from the creepy reference to the race of Fletcher's wife and daughter, even to his size. In reality, Fletcher was only around 5 foot 4 inches tall, that's 1.63 metres, and weighed around 150 pounds, that's 68 kilos. US law enforcement and their weird kind of goggles which seem to make black men and boys considerably bigger or older than they actually are is something which hasn't changed at all over the past hundred years, as has been shown in repeated tragic instances recently, like the police killing of Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old black boy in Cleveland in 2014. There's also the bizarre allegation of him being a, quote, southern agitator when he was from Philadelphia, nowhere near the south. Reading this report, it made me think of Sojourner Truth, the famous abolitionist. Probably her most famous speech is commonly known as Ain't I a Woman? But that wasn't something that she actually said. The most popular transcription of the speech, which is most cited today, was written in the typical dialogue of an English-speaking black person from the US South. But Truth wasn't from the South, she was from New York, and her first language was Low Dutch. So this perception of Northern black people as being somehow Southern wasn't just a one-off. Furthermore, his claim of Fletcher having no education and poor grammar is also clearly incorrect. While he didn't graduate high school, he did attend for two years, and the quality of his English is very clear from all of his written work. Anyway, soon after this report was filed, IWW activists started being rounded up. And then in September of 1917, there are mass raids 
uh, and wobbly offices and mass arrests, or at the least, the issuing of arrest warrants. Many wobblies were arrested in the fall of 1917. Fletcher wasn't. Um, when he heard he was um, supposedly going to be arrested, he chose to travel back to his home city of Philadelphia with his wife and child, and then just took up residence in Philadelphia, found a job um, in a railroad yard in Philly. He didn't hide, but he didn't sort of voluntarily sh um, turn himself into a, uh, a police or federal agent office. It took the federal government about four months, but eventually, like I said, even though he was hiding in plain sight, he was found, if you will, in early 1918 in Philadelphia, and he was arrested. And then he was um, in prison in Philly for a while. Then he got out. And the mass trial of approximately 100 IWWs were set for Chicago, April 1918. April Fool's, I believe, is when the trial began. And apparently Fletcher was late to get to Chicago, according to him, because uh, there was a train wreck on his train from Philadelphia to Chicago. Um, and so when he showed up, he basically just showed up by himself. He wasn't escorted by federal agents. When he gets into the federal courthouse in Chicago, they're like, who are you? And he's like, um, uh, you know, I'm here for the trial. And they're like, what are you just sort of some uppity black from the South side, which is the South side of Chicago. So a sort of subtle racist remark. And he's like, no, I'm one of the defendants, showed him his ID. And then you know, he's then uh, sort of shows up at his own trial. On trial, Ben Fletcher is the only African-American member of the IWW among the approximately 100 IWW leaders and activists who are put in this mass trial on charges of espionage and sedition, another law passed by the federal government in 1918 that further criminalized dissent. After what was the longest trial in the history of the United States federal trial over four months, in which 100 people, five counts each, were um, brought up on charges. No evidence directly implicating Fletcher with really anything, honestly. This complete lack of evidence didn't particularly seem to matter to the court. A jury found all of the defendants guilty on all counts and then sentenced them to um, 10 to 20 years in federal prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. Their sentences to begin immediately, and also ten to $30,000 fines, which when you adjust for inflation, you're talking about more like $150,000 to $300,000 fines, um, which, well, none of these people had. In fact, the inflation-adjusted figures for the fines are more like two hundred dollars to $600,000, or even more if you compare the amounts relative to property prices, for example. The terrible outcome aside, Fletcher still managed to keep a sense of humor about the whole thing. Fletcher also became famous during the trial because he made multiple comments that were repeatedly quoted subsequently and provide further evidence of his humor. One time, what during the trial, he supposedly leaned over to Haywood while the sentencing was being read, um, and he said to Big Bill Haywood, who was the most famous defendant on trial, geez, the judges um, doesn't use very good grammar. And Big Bill's like, why is that, Ben? And he said, it's because his sentences are way too long. He also had remarked during the trial that um, if it wasn't for me, there'd be no color at all in this trial. He's sentenced to this uh, 10 years in prison with his fellow workers who are found guilty of these crimes, quote unquote, are sent in a special train, wobblies only, two days from Chicago or 24 hours, I should say, to um, Eastern Kansas, where then in late 1918, they all are sort of uh, incarcerated there. The cover of the book, uh, of my book, um, is Ben Fletcher's prison photos when he was um, being, I don't know, registered for prison. Um, and they are also images that I hadn't seen and or knew existed earlier in my long time doing work on this subject. They're really the best photos I've ever seen of Ben Fletcher. And when he's looking at the camera, it sort of feels to me that he's looking at me Indeed, his mugshot is a really powerful photo. In general, I've got mixed feelings about mugshots because while it's obviously sad that so many people that I look up to, good people who try to make the world a better place, have got arrested for their beliefs, in a lot of cases, police mugshots are the only records of them still existing of what they actually look like. Another good source of information on historical figures is often trial records as well. Unfortunately, though, there's not much about Fletcher personally in these trial records because, for whatever reason, he didn't take the stand. 
After his conviction, Fletcher is detained in Leavenworth Penitentiary in Kansas, but fortunately he didn't have to serve his whole term. Fletcher's time in prison, he's technically, he's when he's incarcerated from the time he's released is four years, but he, he and a number of other Wobblies actually got out on bond a few years into their time. From 1918 to 22, he's actually in Leavenworth for about two and a half years in total, if I count correctly. For some of our listeners, you might already be familiar with Leavenworth Prison, partly because it crops up often because of just how many workers and political activists got locked up there. But so Fletcher and all these other Wobblies are far from the only political prisoners. And I mean, even though they weren't overtly capital P political, they were clearly political prisoners, tried for their beliefs, imprisoned for their beliefs, no evidence they had committed any crime of a sort of real sort. They weren't alone, right? Like, I mean, there was other political prisoners there, conscientious objectors, including religious conscientious objectors, some left-wingers, communists and anarchists who were also dragooned by the federal government due to espionage and sedition. The most famous of these people was Eugene Debs. He actually didn't go to Leavenworth. He served time in West Virginia and then Atlanta in a different federal prison. There were African-Americans in Leavenworth who were U.S. military soldiers who were convicted of murder due to a complicated situation in Houston, Texas in 1917, but um, in which black soldiers in a segregated unit were um, feeling persecuted by local people, killed a number of local Houstonians in a sort of, uh, like I said, a really complicated situation. This incident is generally known as the Houston Riot. In 1917, white police in Houston, Texas violently arrested a black woman. And when a couple of black soldiers tried to find out what was going on, one of them was beaten and arrested, and the other one was beaten and shot by officers. Hearing about this, as well as rumours that a white mob was approaching, the soldiers armed themselves and headed towards the city. Clashes followed, which left 16 whites dead, including five police, and four black soldiers were killed as well. In the wake of the incident, 110 soldiers were court-martialed and found guilty, 19 were executed and 63 sentenced to life imprisonment. No white people were convicted of anything. Dozens of these black soldiers were thrown into Leavenworth, and Leavenworth, full name Fort Leavenworth, was actually going back to the 19th century, was built you know, by the U.S. Army as part of its Indian wars on the frontier, and is still an army base, in addition to being a federal prison. And so he um, rubbed shoulders with some of these black army men, And according to some recent research, actually smuggled out some correspondence from some of these black soldiers to the NAACP when he left prison in 1922, because these guys all felt that they were falsely imprisoned. Fletcher also um, met and apparently became friendly with Earl Browder, who later became the head of the Communist Party of the United States. And Browder actually writes a very thoughtful and very sympathetic essay about Fletcher in 1925, even though the Wobblies and the communists already had sort of come to hate each other um, in the early 20s. Now, we spoke more about the antipathy which developed between the IWW and the Communist Party in our episode six. And we're going to go into a bit more detail about it in the bonus episode for our Patreon supporters as well. Another famous revolutionary who was imprisoned in Leavenworth alongside Fletcher was Ricardo Flores Magón, an anarchist and one of the leaders of the PLM, Mexican Liberal Party. Flores Magón and the PLM, in exile in the US, organised alongside the IWW, and during the Mexican Revolution, they even launched a joint invasion and takeover of Baja California. Unfortunately, there's no evidence Peter's aware of of Fletcher meeting with Flores Magón, But given their political allegiances and IWW connections and their close proximity for such a long time, it seems that they must have had some sort of contact. In any case, despite appalling conditions which ultimately led to Flores Magon's death, Leavenworth was a hotbed of activism. You know, some people called this the University of Radicals, right, that sort of operated because there was hundreds of these revolutionaries of various stripes, right, who would have interacted on a regular basis, although um, in what ways some of that's, you know, sort of lost, if you will, to history. E.F. Dore talks about how they would have reading groups. Um, Some of the things they read were actually literature without, you know, political nature, right? I mean, prison life is boring and you have a lot of time more than anything else. 
There's also, of course, the racism of the guards that a number of people remark upon. Fletcher was punished on numerous occasions. According to Leavenworth records, which I've looked at and some of which are included in the book, you know, the punishments are quote unquote minor, but like, you know, denying him privileges and the like. And um, we also get to see, thanks to basically surveillance, um, who Fletcher corresponded with while he was in Leavenworth. And so we know that um, Fletcher corresponded with A. Philip Randolph and Chandler Owen, who co-published a magazine called The Messenger out of New York City that was sort of a left-leaning black magazine that uh, A. Philip Randolph later went on to found the Brotherhood of Sweeping Car Porters and became the, the best known black unionist in America. But Messenger frequently wrote about the plight of Ben Fletcher and more generally about the local eight. Um, we know that Fletcher wrote to a man named William Monroe Trotter, who was a black radical newspaper man based in Boston. One article Fletcher wrote was published in April 1920 by the Baltimore Afro-American. In it, he talks about trying to get Baltimore dock workers in the International Longshoremen's Association, ILA, to not carry cargo to avoid the strike by Philadelphia dock workers. When this situation was brought to the attention of the rank and file of these organizations, and they, in any instance, took steps to stop this union scabbing tactics in order to present a united front in their struggles for a better life and industry, their officials immediately drove home the fact that they had a contract and agreement with the employer, and must not violate same even to secure solidarity of labor. Thousands of strikes and hundreds of labor unions were lost as a direct result of this situation. Then aside from this organized scabbery, there was another factor that prevented a successful outcome of the trade union's attempts to get results worthwhile. This factor was the Negro worker, who constitute 15% of the actual wage workers in the United States and produce three-fifths of the wealth in the South. It is common knowledge to the readers of this paper that the Negro worker was almost completely divorced and ignored by the trade unions, mostly affiliated with the American Federation of Labor. The leaders of the American Federation of Labor are for the most part as bitterly opposed to the Negro worker becoming a factor in the affairs of the American labor movement as the employer himself. Naturally, the Negro worker welcomed any opportunity to take the places of members of this organization that was so hostile and prejudiced against the Negro. Therefore, the founders of the IWW, having obtained these facts from their inquiry, were determined that the organization they would put on foot would meet these issues squarely and solve them. Hence, the IWW was organized as an industrial union, it being the avowed aim of the organization to assemble labor in the union as is assembled on the job. Instead of organizing the hod carriers, bricklayers, and carpenters on a building as separate organized workers, organize them as the building construction workers. Second, the IWW was to organize labor regardless of its race, color, or trade. It was held then that race prejudice must not and will not be permitted to play any part in the IWW. Needless to state, these principles have never been compromised, and that is the reason why the IWW is damned, persecuted, and lied about by the employing class and their minions. That is why Haywood and 93 others, including the writer, were sentenced to terms of years as high as 20 years. Concentration of industry makes the American Federation of Labor unable to cope with the growing power of trust magnates. The IWW, by organizing the workers, regardless of race, color, or trade, is forming the structure of another society. Not being organized to just secure more wages, the IWW holds that it is the historic mission of the working class to abolish the wage system. It is the abolition movement of the 20th century, and if sufficient number of workers rally to its standard, complete industrial emancipation will be the heritage of all us workers, and we will become disenthralled from the thraldom of the rich. I think this is a great article, because it doesn't just spell out Fletcher's views on how to build a new society, but it also gets across his frustration with the mainstream labor movement, and the anti-working class straitjacket it was and indeed largely still is, confined to. By signing contracts with employers, unions in the US would then mostly give up their ability to flex their only real power, their ability to withdraw their labour and to strike. This was one of the main reasons the IWW did not sign contracts, as they always refused to give up that power. The workers in Local 8 walked out again in the summer of 1920 in pursuit of a maximum eight-hour working day, as well as for pay rises to match high inflation. After a month-long shutdown without victory, the IWW members decided to go back to work to try to fight again another day.
We know that Fletcher corresponded with Wobblies in Philadelphia, Chicago, and other places. It's really interesting. We don't see all these letters per se, but um, they keep a list, among other things, of who he corresponded with. He also, of course, corresponded with family. And so thankfully, some of the best ways to sort of get at the uh, internal life of Fletcher is to sort of read what his spies kept on him. As one example of this, while the organizers were all in prison, the IWW kept trying to get them out. In December 1921, the Department of Justice wrote a report recommending that Fletcher not be given clemency, which had been requested. He was a Negro who had great influence with the colored stevedores, dock workers, firemen, and sailors, and materially assisted in building up the Marine Transport Workers Union, which at the time of the indictment had become so strong that it practically controlled all shipping on the Atlantic coast. Despite this, Fletcher does eventually have his sentence commuted by President Warren G. Harding and gets out early. He then promptly resumes his activity with the IWW. But the economic and political situation had changed drastically since before the war, and Local 8's days were numbered. There had been a large number of strikes across the US, many of them trying to defend workers from cuts to paying conditions, and they had pretty much all been defeated. In spite of this, the IWW tried to go on the offensive and win a better deal than they already had. 1922, the IWW still is hoping in Philadelphia to sort of have an eight-hour workday. And so rather than ask Local 8 informed employers, we are going to show up for work an hour later than normal, starting day whatever. In typical Wobbly style, rather than just ask for an eight-hour day, workers decided to try to implement it for themselves. So rather than work their usual hours of 7am to 6pm, dockers decided to just work from 8am to 5pm, thus implementing the eight-hour day with one hour for lunch. If the employers wanted them to begin work at 7am like before, the workers resolved they would only do so if paid at the overtime rate. Not surprisingly, employers weren't really happy. I should also note, as in case people are unaware, there was a huge number of strikes in 1919, but also in 20 and 21 and 22 in the US, in steel, in mining, in textiles. Most of those strikes were defeated. And the 20s becomes this very low ebb for unionism in the United States, right? So late 22 is sort of on the tail end of this wave of labor activism in the United States. And at that time, unionism is is growing weaker. Um, The city and federal governments are sort of more willing to engage in repressive tactics as demonstrated during World War I years. Employers had somewhat consolidated in Philadelphia and in shipping. So In 1913, for example, there were more local shipping companies, but by 1922, they're really more multinational, which also means that they can move cargo around from port to port. If there's a strike in Philadelphia, no problem. They can actually ship to Baltimore and New York instead and then put things on rail. And so the power of capital had increased and racism had increased in America. Um, There was a wave of racial violence against black people in Philadelphia and other places in 1919 and beyond. The Ku Klux Klan had grown dramatically during and after World War I. And so in other words, white racism is growing. Xenophobia was on the rise too. Um, The US government actually cut down radically on the number of people who could move to the United States from foreign countries. With this background, the employers decided to try to break IWW organization on the docks once and for all, and so they locked out the workers. Then they engaged the local police to assist them, as well as hiring Pinkerton private detectives. The AFL-affiliated union, the International Longshoremen's Association, also provided large numbers of scab replacement workers. The federal government also intervened on behalf of the employers, paying shipping companies additional money to help them weather the dispute, and the government used its own ships to bring in black workers who had no union experience from the South to work to replace the strikers. The employers then started to try to drum up division between different groups of workers. They wrote letters to particular ethnic groups of dock workers appealing separately to Irish, Polish and black workers, playing them off against one another. And the union was already divided, with a majority of black workers opposed to calling an all-out strike in response to the lockout, and a majority of white workers in favour. But eventually, Local 8 members did vote to strike on the 27th of October. 
and winter is coming, just like in the TV show. And so what that means is that there's less shipping in the winter because back before climate change, the Delaware River would freeze up. And so a lot less work in the winter, but also your expenses go up and you have to buy coal for your apartments. And so workers are needing to make more money prior to winter's start. Arguably not a good time to pull a strike. Nevertheless, what's also going on? The local eight leadership was arguably less effective than they had previously. Their wartime leaders had all been imprisoned, right? And although most of them had gotten out of prison by late 22, they all seemed to be nervous about being thrown back into prison. I can't really blame them. I'd be nervous too. And so we know that it's a a sort of a newer generation of leaders who are leading Local 8 as opposed to Fletcher and Neff and Doree and Jack Walsh. Racial tensions within the union were worsening as antipathy to black strike breakers by white strikers spilled over against their black striking colleagues. By this point, a significant number of black members of Local 8 were also recent arrivals in the Great Migration from the South and so had less union experience and were less committed to the union. And most likely they had less money saved to weather a work stoppage. So some began to drift back to work, further dividing the strikers. Later, IWW organisers from elsewhere criticised the local eight leadership. Their view was that the strike was clearly faltering, and so to keep the union together, they should have called off the strike and returned to work, in order to resume the struggle under more favourable conditions at a later time as the union had done before. But the strike wasn't called off, and after 10 days, it basically collapsed in defeat. And so the AFL will sort of play the federal government in order to sort of take out the rival union. And so a complicated series of events, but by the end of 22, 1922, the um, local eight no longer represents the great majority of Philadelphia dock workers. And although they'll remain and Philadelphia will remain a site of organizing, including of Fletcher in the twenties, always hoping to return to their pre-war heights, that never occurs. By the late twenties, the AFL's dock worker union has consolidated its grip over the Philadelphia waterfront. With the employers having successfully broken the IWW organization on the docks, they could then begin attacking workers' conditions and further dividing the workers to prevent future organizing. The shape-up returns, because the ILA apparently doesn't feel strong enough or willing to sort of fight to protect workers' hiring system. Gangs are resegregated, maybe with the support of employers, but not with the opposition of the ILA. The union local is integrated, but the gangs are segregated. The hiring system declines, and, and democracy ends. If you've ever seen or heard of the film On the Waterfront set in sort of New York, New Jersey in 1950s, the ILA was sort of run by New York City bosses who didn't really care for democracy and used violence and the threat of violence to intimidate their members. And they didn't hold regular meetings. They didn't publish a newspaper for the members because they're not sharing information. And so really the work experience of Philadelphia dock workers diminishes. And according to some reports, racial tensions increase in water, waterfront neighborhoods, which is where most dock workers lived. And so although a union will exist, and that union still represents dock workers in Philadelphia, it's a very different union. Arguably, Philadelphia dock workers were never so powerful as during the time of Local 8. As for Fletcher, he was still working on the waterfront in 1922, but he wasn't in the leadership during the strike. He did, though, continue to be an IWW organiser and public speaker. We know that he continues to be a speaker, and we can only guess that for every time that I find something documenting a speech that he probably gave many others. But, you know, some of the interesting ones I came across was that he gives in 1927, sort of five years after the heyday of Local 8, He goes on a tour of Great Lakes area. So he gives uh, several talks in Detroit that um, receive tremendous compliments from those in attendance. And even one sort of man who recalls in an interview in the late 60s, his time back in Detroit in the late 20s, talking about seeing Fletcher. He apparently also gave multiple speeches on that same tour on the Canadian side of the Great Lakes. And so he uh, shows up in the Finnish language press in Canada and in Minnesota. Um, There was a lot of Finns in the upper Midwest and in lower Ontario and also in upper Ontario and Quebec. I have friends, luckily, who are sort of Finnish Canadians who are able to translate. Um, And also in Finland, there's a group of Finns who are sometimes nicknamed the Red Finns because Finns are sort of overrepresented in left-wing organizing in the U.S. and Canada in the 
teens and 20s and 30s. We actually speak more about working class Finnish communities in the IWW in our episode 9, while episode 1 of our sister podcast, Working Class Literature, focuses on the Finnish wobbly waterfront worker and friend of Ben Fletcher, T-Bone Slim. In 1933, Fletcher and everyone else convicted under the World War I Espionage Act got a full pardon from President Franklin D. Roosevelt. Peter also managed to piece together snippets about Fletcher's later life over the course of his research. I also found him in a German language newspaper in New York City giving a talk in solidarity with the Harlan County mine struggle in eastern Kentucky in the mid-30s, in which, again, he's sort of on the, the bill, if you will, with Roger Baldwin, who was the leader of the ACLU, and with various other prominent figures at Irving Plaza, which also is um, a music concert venue, but was uh, used for many purposes, political and, uh, you know, sort of speaking events. I would love to have known or love to know if, you know, how Fletcher shows up in, say, European press or Latin American press, but I've never found or been shared um, if he was sort of reported on. He was friends with um, at least one, probably multiple Spanish anarchists in Philadelphia um, before the war, because there was a bunch of Spanish sailors who made Philadelphia their home in the mid-teens. One of them was a man named Manuel Ray, who was part of the group arrested. And then because he was a foreign national, he was deported rather than being imprisoned. Although he then snuck back into the U.S. and lived under a different name for the, another 50 years in New Jersey and became a good friend, of course, of Sam Dogoff's. You know, it's reasonable to conclude that because he worked with very Spanish wobbly sailors that were Philly based in the teens, and some of those people probably wrote for the Spanish press, but I've never learned of that you're showing up in Spanish publications, even though the Wobblies produced multiple different Spanish language newspapers. I could love to find him in South Africa because the IWW travels to South Africa imports its motto, becomes very influential in Southern Africa. But there's no direct evidence that Ben Fletcher is known in that region, even if sort of he could be considered to be a sort of a spiritual father of sorts to the, um, and in fact, the largest union that's formed in South Africa in the late 19 teens is Cape Town Dock Workers uh, in what became known as the Industrial and Commercial Workers Union, the ICU who adopted the IWW motto, an injury to one is an injury to all. And so we could guess that maybe by word of mouth that Wobblies sort of bring Fletcher to other places. We can definitely say that in North America, he was a very well-known figure. And then beyond that, it's sort of guesswork, right? Like, or even more so. But he was a well-known figure. And I, the last thing I would say is actually he shows up in the mid-20s uh, speaking at essentially a communist-affiliated Negro Labor Congress, um, and supposedly was a really very well received, which is very interesting because Fletcher already was very anti-communist. We know this from his writings because the communists really sort of stole the thunder of the Wobblies, but also actively undermine the IWW and other anarchistic organizations in many countries in a sort of attempt to seize control of the left, which ultimately worked. By anti-communist here, Pete is referring to opposition to the official Moscow-linked Communist Party line. So what some people would refer to as anti-Stalinist. Sam Dolgoff, who Peter referenced, is a famous Russian Jewish anarchist who moved to the US. He was a real character who mingled with just about every prominent lefty and revolutionary in the US over the course of the whole of the 20th century. We talk more about this stuff in the bonus episode for our patrons. By the 30s, we know that Fletcher moves to New York City and continues to be committed to the IWW and is actually an organizer, although he's also, his health declines uh, very early. So in the early 30s, he has a stroke, maybe a major stroke. And it's not clear if he ever holds down a steady job again. It's also not clear why he moved to New York, nor when he gets divorced. I know that happens. And I know that somewhere along the way, he finds a black wife as his second wife. And they live in Brooklyn for the better part of 20 years together. Um, in a neighborhood that's well-known called Bedford-Stuyvesant or bed Stuy, which at that time was not black majority. And at that time, Walter Neff and E.F. Dori and their wives and their children, those were other local apes who had been part of the wartime persecution, they also live in bed Stuy, even though in the mid to late 40s, that neighborhood starts to become more and more heavily black. 
and also the Dolgas live in bed before they move into Manhattan. Fletcher continues to believe in the IWW and sort of occasionally passionately speak about it, but his wife very likely was the breadwinner due to his poor health, and he died at the age of 59, uh, but he really got sort of weakened in his early 40s, in the early 1930s. Um, and so as the Depression heats up and there's a lot of labor and radical organizing, Fletcher's probably sympathetic and probably paying attention closely. He still hangs out with Wobbly friends, but he's not a leader and he's not an activist on the level he had been really for 20 years from 1910, say, into the early 30s. It's quite likely that Fletcher's time in Leavenworth could have contributed to his poor health. He became considerably weakened in his early 40s. And all we know really is that he was often ill, that he sort of hung out in his brownstone, that he and his wife might or might not have owned, or maybe they were the managers, and it's common in New York City, uh, sort of be a manager resident who would take care of the building. But those sorts of details are just like little bits. And a number of people comment on his often poor health, and he does too in a few letters that he writes in the 30s and 40s, or even in the late 20s through the 40s to various people that are in the book in which he comments on various ailments that he has. Sad. I mean, of course, working class people and people who work in tough jobs, it's not uncommon for them to have low life expectancy, um, especially in a time when access to health care for working people, including black um, working people, is poor. He eventually died at his home in Brooklyn on the 10th of July 1949, aged just 59. Over a hundred people attended his funeral, including many current and former IWW members who sang Solidarity Forever. An extensive obituary, including numerous tributes to him, was published in the IWW newspaper. Even though it had been well over 20 years since he'd stopped being a prominent union leader, he did have an obituary written in the New York Times, which is powerful evidence of his importance, especially given the coverage bias of the Times towards rich and powerful white men. That said, they did get details wrong, like claiming he was involved in the Bread and Roses strike of women textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Despite the biggest battles of Ben Fletcher and Local 8 being over 100 years ago, Peter still thinks there are important things we can learn from them. Well, I think a lot of different people might draw different ones. I think for me, it strikes me that racial capitalism as a concept is deeply important for us to, to sort of consider, and that even though Fletcher himself was perhaps less convinced that that was central, uh, I think a lot of us might actually sort of push back on that. The idea, in other words, that not only do we as sort of believers in socialism, but also equality, or maybe that's redundant, believe that like you can't take for granted that uh, white workers who um, have benefited for so long from a, a society and a world in which whiteness matters, that uh, you can't just simply say that it's going to disappear, even if we are able to sort of push our society and world in a a more human-centered direction. So I think actually one of the lessons is that we might need to think about that more seriously. Even Local 8, after nearly 10 years of forming what I suggest is the most powerful interracial multi-ethnic union of its time in the United States, ultimately fell prey to internal and external prejudices that sort of really ripped apart the union. Of course, the employers played that up as much as possible. And sadly, the government contributed to that. But we can't entirely let the workers themselves give them a free pass. I think we always need to be thinking um, about these matters, in particular in 2020 in America, but in many, many countries, as societies become more diverse, the working class in the US and in many countries, but I'm speaking here about the US, because the working class has been an remains much more diverse than the ruling class. We have to sort of put front and center the, the fact that we are of many different backgrounds, ethnically and racially and nationally, and that we can't simply assume that we're all going to see each other as allies, right? Now, the IWW was, in my opinion, spot on and being anti-racist, but maybe even prioritizing that among its own members could be done more I think the fact that Ben Fletcher was in 1913 a black man who led a white majority organization is also fascinating. 
because it's so rare even 100 years on. I mean, it's less surprising if a black person leads a black majority organization. Local 8 over time actually became more black because black population of Philadelphia grew in the war years. But at its birth, Ben Fletcher was um, maybe one of a third of Local 8 that was African-American. And so that's fascinating for us to sort of keep in mind. Of course, you know, some people might say that another lesson is that we need these sorts of unions, right? And so uh, the IWW has been experiencing a small resurgence in recent years, but it's still a pretty small organization, although it's grown and returned to many countries that it had operated in previously. I think there are dozens of countries where the IWW exists now, and that we might therefore need to be thinking concretely, even about the policies, right? I didn't even mention, but Local 8's policies at its meetings, for instance, was that they would always mandate essentially one of the chairs at a meeting be black and one of their chairs be white. The fact that they very intentionally integrated their gangs. So instead of having voluntary self-segregation, which sometimes happens in in groups, they um, tried to root that out, even if that might be sort of common. And I think that, of course, the, the direct action tactics is a whole other component of lessons, you might say. This is not unique to the IWW or Local 8. Other unions and other even groups of organized workers who are not in formal unions engage in these tactics. But uh, that's deeply important to keep in mind, right? And then really for Local 8, but again, not unique, the central importance of the strike. Uh, Local 8 was born out of a strike, which is not unusual for a union, but it engaged in repeated strikes. It actually took a day off every birthday. And so to the chagrin of employers and without asking permission on their first anniversary and second anniversary and third anniversary, they simply refused to work instead holding a parade for themselves, a party, and take a day off, but that they constantly were threatening to strike. And as we may know, but many of us probably don't, the IWW historically never signed contracts. And they never signed contracts because in many union contracts, including the U.S., there's always a no-strike provision or a no-strike clause. So generally in America, strikes happen in unionized places only in between contracts. However, the IWW believed and believes, as do many of us, that the most powerful weapon workers have is to strike. The threat or the actual withholding of labor is what employers hear best. And so the IWW used that tactic repeatedly, and uh, including on the Philadelphia waterfront. And so I think the tactics of direct action are really important. That, of course, demands a level of engagement and commitment on the part of the members that many unions don't have, um, because unions have, in too many cases, become sort of paper organizations in which you pay your dues, but you don't actively engage and participate but that was not the case on the Philadelphia waterfront or in other IWW locals. And so I think those are uh, two or three different ways that I think Fletcher and Local Eight's story are important for us to sort of consider in our times. And not only that, but Local Eight occupies a unique role in US history. It is amazing that Ben Fletcher and the union that, as I've said already, is, I don't know if there was a more racially integrated union or institution, forget union, name an organization in America in 1915 that was more multi-ethnic and multi-racial, where they sort of were, everyone was equal. I can't, not that I've ever tried very hard to sort of pick every organization. Why is this organization forgotten? Well, I mean, obviously this is part of a larger story. The IWW is forgotten, even though there are still some people um, in the IWW and even though it's grown a little. And even though the stories of the Wobblies are so dramatic and inspirational for many of us, massive uh, repression during the war and then the ascension of a rival left tradition, yeah, communism, uh, who have no desire to sort of keep the flame of IWW ideas alive, far from it, results in basically who is their audience. In Philadelphia, same thing, right? Like really there's no memory of uh, Local 8 and Fletcher. And it's long enough ago that, you know, most people, of course, aren't even around or it's even the sons and the grandsons, right? Like a few people know and family stories. Um, I occasionally meet someone who's like great-grandfather, right? Um, But utterly forgotten. 
Since we carried out this interview and Peter's book has come out, there's been renewed interest in Fletcher in Philadelphia. And Peter is now working with local activists, including the IWW branch, which is still there, to have a mural and historical marker put up commemorating Fletcher and Local 8. That brings us to the end of this double podcast episode. For our Patreon supporters, we've got an exclusive bonus episode for you about Fletcher's views on race and racism, as well as more information about his personal life and Peter's research. You can listen to that by supporting us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. To learn more about Fletcher, you should definitely get hold of Peter's excellent book, Ben Fletcher, The Life and Times of a Black Wobbly. It's available in our online store, link in the show notes. And as a listener of this podcast, you can get 10% off it and everything else in our store using the discount code WCHPODCAST. To learn more about Local 8, Pete has written another book called Wobblies on the Waterfront. You can get that as well on the link in the show notes. As always, in the show notes, we've also got a link to the webpage for this episode, which has got sources, links to more info, transcripts and more. This podcast is only made possible because of support from you, our listeners on Patreon. So if you can, please consider joining us for as little as $2 a month at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Supporters get great benefits like exclusive early access to episodes, as well as exclusive bonus episodes, free and discounted books and merch, and more. You can also support us in a bunch of ways for free. So please tell your friends about this podcast, share links to episodes on your social media, and maybe take a second to give us a five-star review on your favourite podcaster. Thanks again to our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible. Special thanks to Jazz Hounds and Jameson D. Saltzman. Theme tune for this episode is Solidarity Forever, originally written by Ralph Chaplin and performed by Tom Morello, The Night Watchman. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Louise Barry, who also provided additional voiceovers. Last but not least, thanks to you for listening. Catch you next time.